399 B.C. The death of Socrates. You are there. Order Crime Card reporting, 399 B.C. In Athens, Greece, the Hellenistic world is waiting the climax of the trial and condemnation of the philosopher Socrates. Before the sun goes down today, Socrates must, according to Athenian law, perform his own execution and drink the poison hemlock. Charged with corruption of the youth and refusing to recognize the accepted gods of the state, the barefooted sage denied the accusations, and when judged guilty on an almost evenly divided vote, he refused to propose a reasonable fine as his punishment. He thus made a compromise impossible and all but invited the death sentence. Now, as the moment of doom is rapidly approaching, the strange fact is that no one in Athens wants Socrates to die. His enemies, led by the democratic politician Anatus, indeed sought to silence him, but not to martyr him. And his friends, we are told, are still desperately trying to find some way out of this tragic entanglement and save Socrates from the fatal cut. We take you now to Athens, outside the prison, where Socrates is being held. All things are as they were then, except... You are there. This is Harry Marble. We are watching the sinking sun here and counting the minutes in the waning light. Just behind that wall is the cell in which Socrates is awaiting the end. This morning, a group of philosophers, close friends, among them Crito and Apollodorus, were permitted inside, and we were informed by the authorities that they have been conversing with Socrates all day. An hour ago, Xantippe, the philosopher's wife, entered the prison, and this was taken as a fearful sign that all preparations have been irrevocably made to carry out the death sentence, although there are still those who cannot believe that Anatus will be so foolish and stubborn as to allow Socrates to die against the will of the great majority of Athenians of all factions. There is still a desperate hope here that somehow, before the sun goes down, the proud philosopher will emerge alive, and tomorrow they will see him as usual in the marketplace or the theater, the Lyceum, or on the steps of the Acropolis, debating the nature of truth, honor, courage, and justice. There you see Aristophanes, the famous playwright of satirical comedies. He has no doubt just come from the theater of Dionysius, where his play Lysistrata is in rehearsal. It was Aristophanes' play, The Clouds, which Socrates mentioned at the trial as an example of the work of some of his enemies to discredit him. Citizen Aristophanes, one moment. Do you believe that Socrates should die for his crimes? What crimes? He's committed no crimes. Socrates has strong beliefs and opinions, but so have I. So has any man of intellect. Anatus and his ignorant mob cannot silence criticism of themselves by silencing Socrates. Only stupid men would get Athens into such a monstrous predicament as condemning to death one of our most prominent thinkers, and being stupid men, they don't know now how to get out of it. Anatus and his fumbling, sodden greed for rule and power will yet kill us all, I'm sure. But Socrates himself said that you, Aristophanes, gave credence to the accusations against him in your play, The Clouds. In my play, The Clouds, I lampooned Socrates as mercilessly as I knew how. I disagreed with his philosophy, and I still do. But that was in a play, not a public trial. And Socrates or anyone had the privilege of doing the same to me. Didn't Melitus say that he and others were inflamed against Socrates as a result of the clouds? Oh, Melitus, poor poet, poor in rhyme and poorer still in reason. In my play, I portrayed a man like Socrates who ran a thinking shop. And in one of my better scenes, I showed him walking along, looking up to the sky and falling down a hole in his path. But that was comedy. Not one of my best comedies. I understand you also showed how Socrates taught young men to cheat payment of their debts and to beat their own fathers, and if I'm not mistaken, also to deny the existence of the gods. That's true, and what Socrates taught did result in such instances. I witnessed them myself. Aren't these also the nature of the charges that Melitus made against Socrates? I knew they would blame me. Melitus is covering up his own guilt. He's preparing for the day when he himself will be brought before the judges. I'm a playwright. I'm not an executioner. Melitus was directly ordered by Anatus to accuse Socrates. Why does Anatus hate Socrates? Well, Socrates has always made a mockery of this democracy by alphabetical rotation as is being practiced here in Athens. Under these democratic rules, our most important and difficult decisions of government are given to barbers, shoemakers, potters, farmers, and with equal solemnity to sweepers and trash collectors. Did Socrates corrupt Anatus' son? No one can very well corrupt an honest man. Do you think there is any chance that Socrates might yet be saved? I hope that he will. I think that he will not. But valuing what is most precious to me, my greatest concern at the moment is to protect myself. Thank you, Aristophanes. Someone has just come out of the prison. It is Crito, close friend of Socrates. He's going to speak to us. What news is there of Socrates? Socrates is well. 
and calm. Xantippe is with him now for their last meeting. Citizens! I must be heard! I am only hearing! That is Melitus speaking now. He was the main accuser at the trial. In the marketplace, there are people who are howling for my life. The same people who urge me to accuse Socrates. Now, is this justice? Is this reason? I did not want Socrates to be condemned to death. I thought he would be fined as I would have been and gladly paid it had the jury found my accusations false. But where are you now, those of you who voted against Socrates? Why don't you defend me? I did my duty as a citizen. I spoke for Athens, for democracy. Socrates would not accept the verdict. He forced the death penalty. He offered no other way out. He twisted my words and he twisted our intentions and brought this end upon himself. But Anatus this very morning offered to look aside and allow Socrates to escape. Crito knows this. He spoke to Anatus. Let Crito say now if I lie. It is true. Escape was arranged and offered to Socrates. He refused. Why did he refuse? He prefers to die. Socrates prefers it. Not Melitus. Not Anatus. Thank you, Crito. Thank you for revealing the truth. Socrates always said that Melitus was of little consequence in the whole matter. An earnest but unhappy, misled young man. Socrates is not going to die! Anatus has agreed to free him. Anatus told him to play to and Xenophon five minutes ago. Socrates! There have been rumors like this one Socrates! all day, and they were found to be false. Socrates! Ned Calmer, can you confirm Anatus this? Is Socrates to be released? This is Ned Calmer in the courtyard of Anatus' home. There's no sign here of any such event. As you can see, there are Plato and Xenophon still waiting for Anatus to hear them the last time. Citizen Plato, has Anatus acted in some manner to free Socrates? Popular resentment and confusion could well... Here comes Anatus now, and that is Polycrates, one of his main advisors. Observe Polycrates, our two young philosophers, so nobly devoted to the cause of spreading truth. The sun is sinking fast, Anatus, and so with it, perhaps your regime. What shall I think of such uh, truth seekers? who, in my own home and behind my back, bribe one of my slaves to incite all of Athens with the cruel lie that Socrates has been freed. You would not debate with us. You kept us waiting until we could bury it. No longer we had to act. To prove to you the true will and desire of Athens. Socrates was offered his life. If he chooses now to die, it's his will, not mine. He chooses to live, but not as a man adjudged guilty. You are urging us then to subscribe not only to a complete pardon, but also to the rightness of his belief. I am urging you only to look after your own beliefs. For if Socrates dies now, it is yours which will be judged and condemned. Time is running out. I don't want Socrates to die. You say you don't want Socrates to die. Why, at every step of the trial, your master's been offered the mildest of punishments. Even the demand for death was proposed as a way for him illegally to claim another jurisdiction. But he insisted on testing his beliefs with his life. What do you propose that I should do? Free him. Free him without condition. I have no power to free him. No one man in Athens has that power. He was condemned by a majority of 500 jurymen. At your request, Anna. At his own insistence. <laughs> We're back to fruitless debate. Assume the power and free him. I cannot break the laws, which I cherish beyond my own or Socrates' private welfare. The will of the majority is now that Socrates must not die. As a true believer in the principles of majority rule, you should carry out that belief in the intention of your laws and not bind yourself by their stupid inadequacies. You're very clever young men, aren't you? You know how to twist an argument to your own advantage almost as cleverly as does Socrates himself. But when all is said, there remain two opposing principles, a way of life and a way of government. I've risked my life before and I shall risk it again for my beliefs. If Socrates chooses to die for his, and this is his way of warring on mine, I can't blame him, but I can't save him. Are these your last words, Anatus? They are. I can feel no remorse in this old man's wish to die, Polycrates, but what a great sorrow it is that so penetrating a thinker and a patriot and a gentle lover of his city should be lost to the cause of our enemies and his. Ah, well, so be it, Socrates. May the gods in the future find proper honors for you. We have word that all preparations for the execution have been completed. We take you back to Harry Marble now, inside the prison, where the authorities have permitted us to witness the end. We are in the cell now. 
Socrates has requested that he be allowed to bathe himself, and he is still in the bath chamber with Crito. At the wall to the right, you see Apollodorus. The young man with him is Critobulus, the son of Crito. And there on your right are Simeus and Phaedo and Ceres. To your left, Euclid and Terpsian, who came from Megara. Before he went to bathe, Socrates engaged in a long discourse on the meaning of the soul's immortality. It was as if he was speaking out in the marketplace, and there was nothing in his behavior to suggest that this was a man who was about to die. Here he comes now. I just Here is Socrates. To Crito, that the women will be happily relieved now of, of having to wash me after my death. But Crito sees no humor in that, do you, Crito? I was not thinking of the problems of the women. How shall we bury you, Socrates? He asks me sadly in the bath chamber. We have spoken here for an hour or more, and we have all agreed that upon drinking the poison, my body will remain here, but my soul will go to the joys of the blessed. Yet these words still have no effect on Crito. I cannot make him believe that I will be the same Socrates who has conducted this argument. He fancies another Socrates, a dead body, and would still worry about my hard lot. Apollodorus, he says, has brought you a fine garment, Socrates. Is that true, Apollodorus? I have it here. I thought you might desire to wear it for, for such an occasion. And what is my own? Good enough to live in, but not to die in. The thought seemed proper. I do not mean to offend you, Socrates. If I were to be offended, my dear friend, it would not be for this, but for your belief that you must bury me in splendor or grief. You know that I am a man who has cast off the pleasure and ornaments of the body and sought the pleasure of knowledge. Do you not wish to honor me for that? It is my most profound wish. I think I am well adorned. I have arrayed myself not in some foreign attire, but I hope in the true jewels of temperance and justice and courage and truth. Thus, if you wish to lay me out in finery, lay me out in these, and be of good cheer in so doing. As for the manner of burying my body, do with that what is usual and what you think best. The sun is almost down. Of what else shall we speak? Well, is there nothing else? Have you already buried me? Is this the funeral? Why did you refuse the chance to escape? I thought I'd already answered that question, Fado. Do you remember what I said at the trial? You said that if Athens could not endure your discourses and cross-examinations, that it would be irrational to expect that in a foreign city you would be more welcome. I said more. You said that to discourse daily on virtue and the greatest good of man is your life's purpose. And if not allowed that right, you would have no more reason to live. Do you agree with that, Fado? I do. But I'm still troubled. No one in Athens wants you to die. Not even Anatus. Are they anxious, so for my body or my beliefs? I would say for your name, your being. Did they condemn my name or my being or my beliefs? Your beliefs. And what are my beliefs? My name, my body, my being? Your being. Then, they are anxious for my being to live? No. Then what are they offering me? To live bodily without your being. Is that a manner of living, Phaedo, or of death? A manner of death. Then what am I being offered? Death. Thank you, Phaedo. A few more questions. If I choose for my body to die, do my beliefs continue? They do. And my beliefs are my being. Our beliefs are all our beings. 
then what am I choosing? I would say you are choosing to live. And that is what Anitus knows as well. And that is why he would permit me to escape into exile. For in so doing, I would truly renounce my life. I am choosing to live thereby and not to die. You still seem puzzled, Apollodorus. I know that death is a matter which must befall each of us. I know that in dying a man may do with it good or evil. But... I ask if a man does not have a responsibility to his friends and to his children. And if in refusing to go on living, this will not be seen as an act of desertion of responsibility or even Cowardice. A good question. I will try to answer it, but you must help me, Apollodorus. On what principle is my responsibility to my friends based? To receive their friendship and to return it. And of what does friendship consist? To be good in all things toward each other. <laughs> You're repeating yourself. Yes. Yes, I am. To... to give the best of oneself to the other. What is the best of me? My money, my property? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're teaching, Socrates. Well, how did I come by those teachings? By your purpose to search for truth. And you admit that I must give up that purpose in escaping. Would I then be serving my friends with the best of me? No. With what would I be serving? with our desires to see you live. Is it your desire to see me live without purpose? <laughs> oh, do not weep, dear friend. Or if you must, leave us, I pray you. As for my children, I did not agree on bringing them into this world that for their material comfort I should at some time dishonor my principles. When my boys are grown, I ask you, oh, my friends, trouble them as I have troubled you. I must speak to Socrates. I would not be your friend otherwise. I... The sun is near the rim. I must proceed now by the orders given me. You have brought the poison. I will try to answer you, Crito. You asked me the question this morning and I didn't answer you. I have been thinking how to answer it because the question puzzles me deeply as well. Can you wait? Is the sun all but down? I have waited much beyond the time allowed. For I too do not wish to see you die, Socrates. Do not be angry with me now if I tell you that the sun is indeed gone beyond the hilltop. And I have been holding it back only in my mind. Tell me, how do I proceed now? Shall I have any senses left between the drinking and the effect? It is usual that it takes some moments for the numbness to start. Describe it to me. You walk about until there is a heaviness in your legs. Then it will be best to lie down. The poison will then work from your legs upward. Will you give the cup to my friend, Crito? Fare you well, Socrates. You know I must do my errand. I thank you for your good wishes, and I know that you are generous in your sorrow. Crito, I will try to answer your question. Since I have never claimed to know the truth itself, but only how better than any man how to search for it. How do I now know that I am in right in what I'm doing, in the manner of my life and of my death? I ask no answer. You were and are the wisest, the most honorable of men. I wish it were that I could drink this poison and spare you. 
Thank you, Crito. You would spare me nothing. And I would then grieve deeply for you. What is the answer? The answer is that in doubting the truth as others found it, I had to search for my own. It's not what I discovered as truth that may be so right, but that I taught how to discover what is false, and only in so doing can the truth be known. By that principle of teaching, I feel secure in my manner and choice of my life and my death. Have I answered you satisfactorily, Crito? You have. You deceive me, Crito, but I have answered myself satisfactorily, and no doubt you will think more about it tomorrow. My dear friends, may my journey prosper now from this to that other world. Gods of this great earth and of my beloved city of Athens, grant me this prayer. No numbness, nothing yet. See how the sun goes down in majestic peace and order and beauty. If each man's soul could find such shape and movement as this, the reason and joy of heaven would indeed be on this earth. numbness gathers upward like a cold night. Crito, I owe a debt to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay it? I will, Socrates. Is there anything else? Thus was the tragic end of Socrates, the barefoot philosopher of Athens, the first master of the method of dialectics in the search for truth. And this knowledge became the property of his friends, as well as his enemies, as man's quest continued through the ages for the meaning of freedom and justice and virtue and truth. In Athens that night, there was a great sorrow. They could not but grieve for the loss of this stubborn old man, simple and gentle of soul and sharp and clear of mind, who would never let them rest in their comfort and vanity and ignorance. And they were forced to think better and deeper of the true dignity and noble aspirations of man beyond his strivings for luxury, wealth, and power. The cup of poison then became in their minds a test and symbol of high principles and purity. And all who had lived by such goals were bound for centuries after to taste again in some way this bitter brew. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our times. And you were there.
Thank you.